The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, Jesus rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And please be seated. It was seven weeks ago yesterday right here before the altar at United Lutheran Church that our daughter Sarah and her now husband Ian joined their lives to one another in the promises of marriage. It was a joyful day for our family, a memory-making day. And in a day filled with memory-making moments, there is one that stands out especially for us. And that is the exchange of rings in the marriage ceremony. Sarah's grandmother, Peter's mother, Peg Cohen, was not able to attend the wedding because of her declining health. Peg was living in a care facility for people with dementia, and her husband, Doug, decided that Peg's wedding ring was no longer in safekeeping with her. And so Doug chose to give the ring that he had placed on Peg's finger 67 years ago on their wedding day as a gift to Sarah and Ian. And I don't think there was a dry eye among us as family as Pastor Peter told the story of the ring and then gave it to Ian to place on Sarah's finger. This week, we gathered again as family to surround Peg in her dying and then to plan and participate in her funeral service. And sitting next to Doug at Peg's bedside, he said to me, you know, I'm glad she was able to be there, to be present at Sarah's wedding with the gift of her ring. Doug earned the money for that ring, <clears throat> fighting, working as a firefighter one summer uh, in the Rockies and forests. And I suppose that that ring still has some financial worth, but its true value for all of us is that that ring is a symbol of a love and a promise that endured. It's a sign of a love and a promise that created a family and became a gift a blessing, a witness to us all and to others. In the reading from Genesis for this second Sunday in Lent, we hear the story of a family created and sustained by God's love and promises. Today's Old Testament reading begins with a man not likely expecting any more children, Abram is 99 years old and his wife Sarai is 90. In fact, the idea of having more children is so preposterous that Abram laughs out loud at God's suggestion. And yet, God persists. The Lord makes a promise, a covenant with Abram. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations and later points Abram to the stars in the sky as a sign 
of God's promise to them. This covenant comes with name changes to signify a new relationship status with God. Abram becomes Abraham and Sarai, Sarah. And their names are to remind them of their new identity and calling as God's beloved people forever. Now this is not to say that Abraham and Sarah went on from that moment in time uh, as perfect people. Like every family, like all of our families, they were a family who struggled and fell short and needed God's forgiveness. And yet for Abraham and Sarah and for us all, despite our failures, God remains faithful. God persists in loving us. God gave Abraham and Sarah a promise and a call to serve God's divine purposes in the world. And God does this throughout scriptures, using those who others see as too old or too stubborn or too broken, but whom God sees as just the ones to love and bless. Abraham and Sarah were given the gift of God's promise and trusting in God's promise, they followed God into a new future, not a secured, safe future just for the two of them, but a future that would bind their lives and their descendants' lives to God's promises and purposes. In the Gospel reading for today, the disciple Peter is certain that he has found in Jesus the one who is going to bless his life and his nation with the promises of God. Just outside of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus is walking together with his disciples when he turns and he asks them what it is that people are saying about him. And the disciples tell Jesus that the crowds do recognize him as someone special. They say that you're a prophet, that you're a holy man from God. And then Jesus gets to what is likely his real question, but who do you say that I am? And Peter declares that Jesus isn't just a prophet, but he is the long-awaited Messiah, the one anointed by God to save. And Jesus uses that moment, Peter's proclamation, as a teachable moment. And he begins to teach them for the first time about the kind of Messiah that he has come to be. He's going to undergo suffering and rejection and death and rise. And Peter? Peter is not having it. This is not the path he imagined would lead to God's promise and blessing. But Jesus persists. Jesus is on his way to the cross, and there's no way around it. God's promise of new life comes in the most mysterious of ways. It is denying and dying that leads to rising and new life. That's how it is in the economy of the kingdom, in the kingdom of God. Abraham and Sarah left behind the life they knew in order to follow God into God's future and promised blessings for them. And Jesus left behind all of the glory of heaven in order to take on human flesh and enter into a new relationship with humankind. And Jesus would go on to give up his very life in order to share God's love and new life with the world. Jesus calls those who would follow him to deny, to give up, to die. But always in the embrace of the promise that as we let go of lesser things, we do so in order to take hold of God's greater gifts. Gifts of mercy, grace, forgiveness, new life. When we look to the cross of Jesus, we see that God's way is to create new life and new relationships with humankind
through promises of love and mercy and forgiveness. And taking up the cross is following in Jesus' way of love and mercy and sacrifice as our way of life. The cross represents God's commitment to humanity, and the cross calls us to life-giving commitments for the sake of others. Jesus says if we want to follow him, we need to deny ourselves, to take up the cross, and to follow him. So what does that look like for you and I in our daily lives? I've been thinking about that, praying about it. I wonder if it might mean that in a nation deeply divided, we might give up asserting our opinions so loudly in order to really listen and hear, try to hear someone else's perspective maybe even learn something from it. Or maybe in our personal lives, it means giving up or letting some of my anger die in order to forgive someone and be free. Or maybe it means <clears throat> letting go of our anger in order to, or maybe it need, excuse me, or maybe it means letting go of my need to judge or to categorize someone and to simply love them rather than feel superior somehow to them. It might mean letting go of some of my resources to create opportunities and healing places for someone I don't even know, but I know God knows and loves. I think it means giving up on surrounding ourselves only with people who make us feel comfortable in order to lift up those who do not feel loved and valued by anyone else. In all of these ways and so many more, we're called to deny ourselves, to take up the cross, to follow. And I wonder how many problems in our lives and in our world might be healed and given new life if we could let something die so that God could allow something new to come to life in us. On Ash Wednesday, as the season of Lent began, I looked out over all of you gathered here, and you were standing there with ashes smudged on your foreheads in the shape of a cross. And you were so beautiful in that moment, <clears throat> it took my breath away. Because I saw in that moment just who you are in Christ, who we are. A people, a family, a force created by God's love in order to love one another and the world by taking up the way of the cross. You are people loved dearly and deeply and called to love the world as Jesus loves it. And the promise, the promise that is given is that as we love the world as Jesus loves, our lives too are healed and made whole and abundant. We have been given so much. The story of God's relationship with God's people is the story of promises fulfilled. From God's covenant with Abraham and Sarah to God's coming among us in Jesus, God acts again and again to create life-giving connection with humanity. No matter how many generations pass away or how the world changes or how often we turn away, God persists, God remains faithful, God continues to love us. And God's promise calls us to be signs of God's love and faithfulness for a world in need of the cross-shaped 
love of Jesus. Amen.